uh, concluding our series today on the art of prayer. And I want to talk about being confident in prayer because I, I know many of us, and myself included, from time to time will struggle to be confident about our prayer life. We say things like, well, I don't know what to pray for in this situation. Or I don't know what to say. What words do I use when I pray to God? Or I don't know how to say it. And how long should I actually keep praying for something? We have questions like that, don't we? And some of us are even get to that point where we, we wonder if our prayer is even effective. There are times in our life, isn't there, where we can lack confidence in our prayer life. So I want to talk about that this morning. To look at how we can be more confident when we pray. How we can take the worry out of our prayer life. And I'm confident this will help us because Jesus is our teacher. As we just had read for us from scripture there, this is a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, these few verses that we're looking at today, Matthew 7, 7 to 12. And in this sermon, Jesus teaches us several principles that can help us to pray with confidence when we come to prayer. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your background, Jesus' principles here, if we apply them to our lives, can help us to pray with great confidence. You might be saying to yourself, I don't really know how to pray that well. Well, here, Jesus helps us overcome that, to pray with confidence. You know, um, there are many parts of life, in fact, all of life, if we would just do things the way Jesus teaches us to do them, we would have much more confidence. And, and prayer is one of those areas. It would, uh, if we could just apply what Jesus teaches us, it would transform our lives. And, and as we apply these principles to our prayer life, I'm confident it will transform your prayer life. So here Jesus says, as we, as we heard earlier, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks the door will be opened. This is a great promise to us all, a great promise to us all. Jesus is promising that we will get our response to our prayer any time we pray. If we ask, seek or knock, we will get a response to our prayer. He says, if you ask, you will receive. Not you might, you could, you will. If you ask, you will receive. He says, if you seek, you will find. These are definite words. If you knock, the door will be opened to you. In other words, when you pray, you're heard. God in heaven, our almighty God, our heavenly Father, hears you when you pray. And that should give us great confidence. And then Jesus goes on after this to, to give us several reasons why we don't need to worry when we pray. We don't need to worry about what we say. We don't need to worry about where we are when we say it. We don't need to worry about how we say things, a particular form of words. We don't need to worry about how long we pray for, if it's too short or too long, or if we're just praying once, or do we keep praying every day for the same thing, do we repeat ourselves? We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We simply don't have to worry about them. We can be confident. And so you might want, to, might want to take your phone out and take a few notes as we go through this, or a piece of paper and a pen and take a few notes. I always find it important, if, if, if the Lord finds it important enough to tell us something, then it should be important for us to perhaps write it down. I certainly feel that way, because I don't remember things that well. And so the first thing that Jesus teaches us in this passage is that God promises to answer us if we keep on asking. If we ask the question, God will answer us. When Jesus gives the instruction to ask and seek and to knock, these are present participles that he's using here. And so that means that we should keep on asking, we should keep on seeking, we should keep on knocking without ceasing. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Be persistent in prayer. Now, I know some of you have studied this passage in depth over the years and you'll know that. You hear that quite frequently when someone preaches on this passage of prayer that we are to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking. But I wonder if you've ever asked, why does Jesus use three different terms here? Why doesn't he simply say, as we might in English, be persistent in your prayer, keep asking? Ask, ask again, and then ask again. That's how we might say that in English. 
But Jesus actually uses three different terms here. Ask, seek, knock. Have you, have you ever asked why he does that? There's a slightly different meaning, obviously, for each of those terms. And each one of them has something to do with proximity. Our proximity to our Heavenly Father. When I'm close to my father, if I'm a child and I'm close to my father, if I'm physically close, like in the same room, then I would just simply turn around and ask my father a question. That's true, isn't it? And so when you're close to God, then all you need to do is ask, like a child asks their father, God, I need this. Daddy, would you help me with this? And when you're close to God, you just simply ask the question. But sometimes we're not so close to our fathers. And sometimes we're not close to God. And when you're a kid and you wanted to ask your dad something and he wasn't in the same room, well, you had to go and find him, didn't you? You had to get up, you had to, had to move yourself and go and find him. You had to go and seek him out. He might be in the garden. He might be in the shed. He might be in the kitchen. Who knows? Or somewhere else in the house. But if your father's not close to you, you have to get up. You have to move. You have to seek him out. You have to get into proximity before you can ask the question. You have to get close. And of course, the same is true with our interaction with God. Sometimes we have to seek him out because we're not close to him. And that might be for all sorts of reasons. You might be busy, so busy doing what God's asked you to do that you didn't notice he's actually moved and he's doing something new somewhere else. And when you look up, you realise, why do I feel like God's distant? You realise, I need to adjust myself. I need to think about, well, where is God and what is he doing now? And how can I adjust my life to fit in with what he's doing, to seek him out, to seek out this new thing that he might be doing and get close to him? And then there are times when we'd have to knock because our our dads, as kids, you know, you go seeking dad and he might be in the office or in the shed with the door closed or something and you, you need to knock on the door because there's a barrier there, a door or a wall or something like that. And when there's a barrier, we need to knock. And so so when I'm in close proximity to my Heavenly Father, I just ask. When we don't know where God is, we feel distant and we need to seek him out. And then when there's a barrier between me and God, then we need to knock. We need to knock the barrier down. We need to ask him to help us knock it down. It could be a barrier of sin, a barrier of rebellion, a barrier of rejection, a barrier of ignorance could be any kind of barrier and we need to work with the Lord to knock it down so that we can get into proximity with him. The point of what Jesus is saying here is that it doesn't matter what the distance is. You can go to God anytime, you can pray to God anytime and he will hear you. That should give us confidence, right? doesn't matter how far we've drifted, doesn't matter how spiritual someone might look, doesn't matter how destitute they might look, when anyone turns to God, he will hear them. That should give us great confidence. No barrier is too great for God not to hear us when we come to him in prayer. He just wants us to ask, and that should give us great confidence. It says here, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find him. Knock, and the door will be opened. The barrier will be removed If you knock. So that's the first reason we can pray with confidence because God will always hear us. He will always answer us. We can pray with confidence. And here's the thing we can ask for anything. You can ask God literally for anything you want. Now, of course, He's not a slot machine or a vending machine, (laughs) but we can pray with confidence because we can go to God with anything. There's nothing that He doesn't know that you can take to him that's going to be a surprise to him. And we can pray with, we can ask him for, we can ask him for anything because we can be confident he will never give us anything that's unhelpful. He'll never give us anything in answer to our prayer that's unhelpful in our lives. Because it's true, isn't it, that sometimes we just don't know what's good for us. We just don't know what's good for us. I mean, I've been asking the Lord for a Maserati for years and he hasn't given it to me yet. 
And he keeps, oh, I'm assuming his answer is, Wayne, your ego is big enough. You don't need a luxury car to drive around in. It's not going to help you. It's not helpful. It's not true. I haven't really been asking for a Maserati. But it gives me great confidence to know that I can go to the Lord and ask him for anything because he's not going to ever give me anything that's unhelpful to me. It's true. Sometimes when we pray, we ask, or we think to ourselves, I don't know if what I'm asking for is good for me. I don't know. Is it good for me or isn't it good for me? Sometimes we just don't know, but the Lord knows. He knows. And we can go to him confidently because he will never give us anything that's unhelpful for us. Of course, he won't give us everything we want. We know that. Because not everything we want is helpful for us. It says in in verse 9, Matthew 7 verse 9, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Well, if you're hungry, a stone's not very helpful, is it? Bread is. But a stone's not particularly helpful for someone who's hungry. I think it's pretty straightforward. A normal parent is not going to give a hungry child a stone. They'll give them something to eat. And so Jesus' point here is that that's ridiculous. God is only ever going to give you something that's helpful in answer to your prayer. He says, he's teaching us, you can ask God for anything, but you'll only get it if it's helpful for you. If you ask for something worthwhile, then the Lord's not going to give you something that's worthless. If, even if you ask for something that's going to be bad for you, you're not going to get it. The Lord won't give you something that's bad for you. He'll only give you something that's helpful for you. He knows what you need better than you do, and he knows what will make you happy more than you do. He loves us. He's never going to give us something that's bad, even if we ask for it. And so we can be confident as we go to the Lord in prayer that we can ask him for anything, even if we're unsure if it's the right thing, because he only ever has our best interests at heart. He will never give us anything bad, And because of that, we don't really need to sanitise our prayer. We can pray and and, and use whatever words we need to to pray to God and ask him for whatever we want. We don't have to censor our prayers to a degree. Because there are times when we're not so sure, we're not so confident that that we should be asking for something. You say to yourself, well, I I don't know if I really should be praying for this. Well, we don't have to worry about that. We just ask. Our job is to ask. And we can ask for anything. The Lord's job is to answer and to answer in a loving way. And he'll only ever give us stuff that's helpful. We can have that much confidence that we can pray to the Lord and ask him for anything, whether or not it's good, bad or otherwise. And he will only ever respond with something that's helpful for us. Another reason we can pray with confidence is because God will never give us anything that will harm us. This just goes a little step further than the previous point. Not only will God never give you anything unhelpful, he will also never give you anything that's harmful. Friends, God will never hurt you. You know, uh, your child might ask you, can I drink this bottle of bleach? Well, as a a decent parent, of course you're going to say, don't drink that because you know it's going to kill them. When verse 10 We're given a similar example here. It says, um, verse 9 and 10, Which of you, if your son asks for a fish, will give them a snake? Well, in in the first instance, he says, if if they ask for bread, you wouldn't give them a rock. In this one, if you ask for fish, you wouldn't give them a snake. Well, a rock is a little bit different to a snake, right? A rock for a hungry child is unhelpful. But a snake for a child who wants a fish is not just unhelpful, It's dangerous. It's harmful. And so what he's saying here is that God won't give you anything that's unhelpful and also he won't give you anything that's harmful in your life. Sometimes you might ask for something that's actually dangerous. You might ask for something that would actually be deadly or incredibly destructive in your life. God says it doesn't matter. Just go ahead and ask the question. Because He will never give us anything that's deadly or destructive. He's saying to us that he'll figure it out. He'll sort it out. We don't have to worry that he will take care of it, that he's never going to give us anything that will hurt us. And so if you're wondering, should I pray for this or shouldn't I pray for this? 
you're just invited to ask the question. If, you, if you're thinking, I don't know if this is right for me, I'm not really sure what's right in this situation, just go ahead and ask. God will figure it out. He's capable. He's almighty God. Great. How great thou art. He's the God of the universe. He's big enough to work that out. So we don't have to figure it out. He's never going to give you anything that's unhelpful and he's never going to give you anything that's harmful. And he'll always hear you. Even if we're unsure about what we're praying for, we can be confident God has our best interests at heart. So they're the negative reasons, if you like, the things that God won't do when we come to him in prayer. He won't give us anything harmful and he won't give us anything that'll hurt us. But on the positive side, we can have confidence because of what God will do when we pray to him. He will only ever give us what's best for us. Jesus explains this in the next verse, in verse 11. He says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good gifts to those who ask him? So no matter what you ask for, God will only ever give you what's good for you. He's our Father in heaven. We don't have to say fancy words. We just have to keep it simple. Say, God, I need this. And that's a good enough prayer. God will sort all the other stuff out. And he will only ever give us what's best for us. Now, of course, he won't always give us what we want because often what we want is not what's best for us. But he will give us what we need for our eternal good. And I use those words intentionally. He'll give us what we need for our eternal good. Romans 8.32 says this, God did not keep back his own son, but he gave him for us. If God did this, won't he freely give us everything else? This means that on the cross, Jesus purchased everything we need for our eternal good. And when our Heavenly Father gave us his very own Son, he showed us that he's willing to give us everything we need, even his own Son, for our eternal good. All things God gives us are for our eternal good. Some people think, well, I've been cursed by God. I've, got, I've been afflicted by God. God's taken stuff away from me. I've got a disease and a disability. I'm cursed by God, but God doesn't curse us. God loves us. All things he gives us are for our eternal good, including affliction, including loss, including disease and including disability. This is something that the world knows nothing about. And, and often we get caught up in this, don't we? We have this short-sighted view that I've got this disease, I've got this problem, um, I've got this disability, I've got this affliction. You know, God, can you, can, can you take this away? And we don't see that God might actually be using that for good in our life. Our Heavenly Father has an eternal vision for our lives. And if I can achieve anything today, I want, you to, I, I want to be able to raise your eyes up to see that, that our Almighty God has an eternal vision for your life. Not just this life, but the next life as well. If you're given singleness, for example, instead of marriage, it's because Christ purchased that for you, for your eternal good on the cross. If you've been given a disability or a disease that's not healed in this life, it's because Christ purchased that for your eternal good on earth. And all of us are carrying some burden, aren't we? And Christ has purchased those troubles for us for our eternal good, to shape us and to form us to be more like him in this life. There's no promise on the cross that Christians will have health and wealth in this world. You might, but there's no guarantee of it. Jesus didn't purchase for you a guaranteed job, a guaranteed marriage, guaranteed wealth, a home or success in your business. He didn't purchase a guarantee of those things on the cross. You might have those things, but only if they serve your eternal good. 
When Jesus died and rose again, our Father was purchasing all the things that are for our eternal good. And this should give us confidence when we pray. Confidence to ask for anything. If God didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, then he will certainly give us everything we need for our eternal good. One more reason that we can pray for conf- with confidence. And we see this in verse 12. Jesus says there, So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So God wants us to do for others what we want them to do for us. And most people will know this verse as the golden rule. The golden rule. Treat others how you'd like to be treated. That's the golden rule, isn't it? But have you ever wondered why Jesus connected the golden rule to prayer? He's teaching us about prayer here. He's teaching the golden rule, yes. But he's couched the golden rule within teaching, within a sermon about prayer. Have you ever made that connection? That the golden rule doesn't just stand on its own. It does stand on its own, but it doesn't just stand on its own. That Jesus actually taught this golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. He taught it within the context of teaching about prayer and how we should pray. What does that mean? What is Jesus trying to show us here? Well, it's not that, not that difficult. What it means is that when someone says to you, would you pray for me? And you think to yourself, what on earth am I going to pray for? Well, you simply pray for them what you would want them to pray for you. So uh, if, if you want safety and security and success in your life, then pray for safety and security and success in the lives of others. If you want financial, the financial blessing of God in your life, then pray for the financial blessing of others. If you'd like to have health in your life, then pray for health in the lives of others. If you'd like to be better at using your time and scheduling your time, then pray that others will be better at scheduling their time and using their time wisely. Whatever you want God to do for you, Pray that he will do that for others as well. We are blessed by God to be a blessing to others. That blessing doesn't just stay with us. We we are blessed to be a blessing to others. When we pray for other people, pray what you would like to have prayed for you. And so, friends, we can be confident in prayer because our Heavenly Father loves us and he hears us. All of us, no matter who you are, where you've come from, how close or how far you feel from God, he loves you and he hears you. And we can be confident because he hears us and he says he will answer us if we ask, seek and knock. If we're persistent in prayer, he will answer us. We can be confident because he will never give us anything unhelpful. We can be confident because he will never give us anything that will hurt us. We can be confident because he will only ever give us those things that are for our eternal good. And we can be confident because God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing to those around us.